This episode of Brains on Games is all about leading your Stone Age tribe to victory. Welcome to Brains on Games. I'm Dr. Brian McDonald. In this episode, we're going to talk about a game that's all about creating the best, most powerful Stone Age tribe. It's a game that came out a, probably a couple of years ago now. I backed it on Kickstarter when it first was created, but last week, the same company delivered two expansions, the, the Vulketh Invasion and Beasts and Bronze. So we're going to talk today about all three of those, the base game and the two expansions, because I do feel like this is a game that's not discussed enough. It's a game called Rise of Tribes by Breaking Games. This is a game that you can play with between two to four players, but the Vulketh Invasion expansion adds a solo mode that we'll discuss. You can play it with kids age 10 and up, and a game can be played in 30 minutes to an hour. That's one of the things that I think is fantastic about this game because it evokes all the same feelings, I think, and, and the same sorts of puzzle solving that you would do in, in quite a complex strategy game, but it boils it down and keeps things moving quickly. So it's a great introduction to area control games and, and some of the more advanced strategy games that adults like, but you can play this one with 10 year olds, which is perfect. Like I said, Rise of Tribes is an area control game and you can probably see a couple of the tiles that I've laid out here. One of the things I think that's neat about this game that allows you to bring in younger players or, or people who aren't very familiar with strategy board games is that everything's sort of divided up in modules. There are advanced pieces that are sort of hidden under another part of the box that will allow you to increase the complexity of the game, but you don't have to play with all of those. There are a number of things that make this game unique, and I'll try and chat about those as we go. But of course, if you have any questions, or if I mix anything up and you want to let me know, you can add a comment below the video. The three types of terrain in the game are lakes, which generate food. There are mountains that generate stone, and there are forests that generate wood. So you're collecting resources as you play. We'll talk about that when we get to that section of the turn. You begin by setting up the tiles. It's a modular board, so you take out a certain number of the tiles depending on how many players that you're playing with. You shuffle those up and they get dealt out randomly to create your board. And that does make every game unique, especially if you start adding the more advanced tiles like glaciers, for example, that cover up mountains. The game comes with 14 of these dice. You can see them laid out here. This is what the setup will look like at the beginning of the game before the first turn. You've got these dice that have suns on two sides, there's moons and there's blank sides as well. And the faces that you roll before you choose your actions are going to determine how powerful those actions might be and whether or not an event occurs. Each player will also get one of these tribe boards. This is the player board. They've all got different requirements in terms of what resources they can spend to create a village on a hex on the map. We'll talk about what that's all about. It indicates where you can put goals that you're working on or goals that you've completed. If you flip it over, there are instructions for the turn order. We'll talk about how to go through a turn. And one of the advanced things about the game that I quite like is that there are also asymmetric powers for different tribes. So the one that I showed here, the Dananu, if you, I think that's how you pronounce it, uh, they've got this double-sided card that gives them some sort of ability, but each tribe has a different one. One of the things that the Dananu tribe can do is that if they're gathering resources, they get an extra food for each village that they have. So that's a neat ability, the agriculture ability, but it is a two-sided card, so you get to choose. Your, your tribe is assigned randomly, but then you get to choose which ability you're going to have uh, before you start the game. The first phase of the turn, you're going to score your villages. And each village is going to give you a victory point at the beginning of each turn. So it's certainly in the player's best interest to try and take over those hexes where you've built villages so that they can destroy them and you won't get the points. We'll talk about that once we get into the, conf the conflict part of the game. Once you've started to build those villages, you're going to be racking up those victory points pretty quickly unless someone slows you down. The next thing that you do is that you roll the dice. There are two extra dice that don't fit here on the main 
player board and you roll those to determine how powerful your actions are going to be before you choose what action you're going to take. If you roll doubles, whether it's two blanks or two suns or two moons, an event is going to be triggered. And this really adds something. I think it adds a little bit of randomness to the game. It, it adds a, a new puzzle maybe to solve or some additional powers that, that one of the players might be able to win. One of the events is that you can spend some resources to build walls around your village and that's going to protect you if anybody tries to attack a hex where you have those walls. The card that I pulled out here is a drought and that drops the maximum population in a hex and it means that you're not going to be allowed to have as many of your tribes members in one space, one hex of the board. How do you remove that drought from play? The next time a player rolls any doubles, that card that event card gets moved over to the discard pile and the drought is resolved. You no longer have to worry about it. There can be a couple of events in play at any given time, but you wouldn't usually even have an opportunity to get a third one because if you roll doubles, many of those events are going to get uh, taken off the board. Once you've rolled your dice, let's say I've rolled a sun and a moon here, then you get to choose your actions. That's the third phase of the turn. And this, I think, is a, a clever innovation, maybe, of this game. Because what you do, if I... I mean, there are four different actions to choose from. I'll go through them one at a time. We can start with grow. So if I want to take a grow action, what I do is I slide one of my dice along here and then move the one that gets knocked off down underneath. That shows that I'm taking the grow action, but the number of suns or moons is going to determine how powerful that action is. So if I have one of my tribes members here, you can see they're little wooden meeples. Each of the tribes has a slightly different shape to it. If I have a tribes member here and I do this grow action, I've got two suns. That means I get to do the more powerful version of the action. The default version is that I'll get to add three tribes members to that hex or to any hex where I already have a tribes member, so I can split them between two. But because there are two suns here, I get to add four instead of three. Now, if instead I had put a moon here and there were two moons, well then, I get the less powerful version of the action, and in that case, I only get to add two tribes members when I'm growing my tribe. So now I've got a crowd here of five meeples on one hex, and that's the that's your limit. Once you exceed that limit of five, something's going to happen and you have to start taking those figures off the board until you get down to that population limit. Now, let's say there were some other members of a different tribe in an adjacent hex. Maybe the other thing I might want to do is move. So in that case, I would slide this moon over here. Now there are two moons, so I get to do the less powerful version of the move. I won't get to move four of my meeples, I will only get to move two of them. I could move two over here like this, and now there are going to be two tribes occupying that space. Conflict is only triggered in this game if you exceed the maximum population. So here there are five, that's the maximum. If there were six, then there would be a battle that would occur in, in the next phase of the game. One other important aspect of the game, sometimes it's important for resolving events, sometimes it's important for achieving your, your goals that you have as a tribe, it are some definitions of what's happening here on the board. Here I control this mountain because I only have my tribes members here. Here I'm occupying the lake, but I don't have a majority, I don't control it. The yellow tribe has the majority here. So you can occupy, you can control, or you can have a majority. And those are three definitions that are important in some parts of the game when you're resolving goals or, or maybe you're res resolving some event. You're going to find the tribes interacting often because the map is pretty crowded. In a two-player game, there are only nine of those tiles and things start to pile together pretty quickly, partly because you need different kinds of resources to build your villages, for example, and that means you've got to spread out across the board in order to find those resources when, when you gather things up so that you can start building those villages and earning those points. You also need to spend resources to resolve goals, and we'll talk about that in a later phase of the game. So there's going to be lots of places 
player interaction and conflict, almost every turn you'll find that you're interacting with the other players. One of the things that sometimes happens when you're playing with younger kids, they have a tough time working together sometimes against the lead player. Maybe you can get siblings to work together against a parent. But I know I found in some of these games there'll be one player who you can clearly see is about to take the lead. But, you know, my son wouldn't be able to convince his cousin to work together against that player who was in the lead because it's hard for younger kids to kind of entertain the idea that you can work together with an opponent who you're also trying to beat. They don't trust the the opponent. So they're not even thinking necessarily uh, about the leader of the game, they're just out for themselves often when be, and, until they learn a bit more about playing these kinds of strategy games. So that can be an interesting uh, skill that you can develop, that idea of working together with an opponent, even though you're not really working together for the whole game. It's sort of a temporary truce, you might say. Uh, but I know younger kids do have a hard time kind of keeping those two opposing ideas in their mind. Uh, working together with the player they're also trying to beat. Now, I could have chosen to gather resources. And in this case, the typical action would be that I can gather two resources from each of two hexes that I occupy. I don't have to be in control of it, so I could get some food here from this lake, even though there are some other tri there's another tribe here in the same hex with me. The lead action is an interesting one. The lead action allows you to draw cards from this deck. So each player is going to have a, a deck like this in their color of different goals or developments that they might be able to create. A cart would allow you to improve your movement when you're moving tribes members from one hex to another. So you can move two additional tribes members if you have a cart, which makes perfect sense. So if you take a lead action, you can draw. The base lead action is to draw two of those cards and you'll have them on the side of your board. It says in progress goals here on the side. It might be hard to see everything. It's a, it's a little crowded with my little camera. This goal will be in progress until I spend two food and one wood to kind of invent that technology and then I have it for the rest of the game. That's also going to give me one victory point if I invent that cart and then I can start moving extra uh, meeples around the board. Basketry is one that allows you to gather additional resources and you might also be trying to win some of these goals. Now the, the, the goals here tend to give you extra victory points. So you might get two, I'm not sure some of them might have three, but in this case, you'd have to have the majority of your meeples in five hexes that are connected to one another. So you you might really be trying to spread yourself out. You might spread yourself thin a, a little bit in order to occupy as many of those things as possible and then try to grow to get the majority. And, and those are the beginning phases of the game. So you check for victory points based on the number of villages. You roll those dice. You choose two of those actions, whether it's grow, move, gather, or lead. And then the next phase is that you have to resolve those conflicts. So if I had been able to move some extra tribes members over to this hex that has the yellow guys, now I've got more than five, so it exceeds the population limit and I have to start pulling tribes members off. So each player is going to take off one of these meeples at a time until there's only one color left in the hex. And in this case, I had one extra guy going in. So all of those other tribes members are going to be lost. They're put back into your supply, but I get to now have the majority. I, I'm in control here now in this hex. There's nobody else there. Once the conflicts are resolved, you get to build villages if you have enough resources. So that first tribe I pulled out, the Dananu tribe, they need four fish, one stone, and one wood in order to build a village. And the villages look like this. This is from the deluxe version, so they're wooden villages. So if I had the resources, I could place a village here. And now at the beginning of my next turn, I'm going to score a victory point for having that village. Another thing that you can do 
with the villages is that if you take a lead action for each village that you have, you can get rid of a goal that you have that's in progress. So maybe it's one a goal that you can't achieve in the next couple of turns. So each village, you can take one of those, put them at the bottom of your deck and draw an extra card to replace it. So rather than just drawing two, I might get rid of one now because I have a village and then draw three new ones in order to get maybe the advantage that I want. Two of the technologies that really tend to be sought after in the games that we play uh, would be the bow. Now the bow allows a player, when you're initiating a conflict, when you're the attacker, you get to take one of the defenders off the hex before you start resolving the conflict. So that's a really powerful advantage. That means that I would still have two of, of my tribes members on this hex instead of just one because I could have knocked one of those yellow guys off before the conflict started. The other one that we often really try to get is the horse because the horse allows you to move two hexes instead of just one. Of course, if you've got uh, guys on horseback, they're going to be able to go farther. So it is, it's thematic in that way. It, those advantages all make sense and you keep those through the game. They also earn you a victory point when you achieve them. And those are achieved, those goals, you spend those resources in that same final phase as when you can build a village. Once you've built your villages or completed your goals, then the next player gets to start and go through those five phases and it just continues to go around like that. You're racing to get those 15 points and they can rack up pretty quickly. The events, I think some of them are really interesting and fun. There's one where you could have a mammoth on one of the hexes on the game and you can choose to either kill the mammoth and then you get some resources or you can tame it and then that has some additional advantages for you. There's an event, like I think I mentioned earlier, where you can build walls. You get to take one of the attackers off the board, so it's sort of the opposite of the bow. So a defender gets to take an attacker off the board before the conflict resolves. This game does present some interesting puzzles, I think. A great introduction, like I said, to area control games and strategy games, and you can really ramp up the difficulty depending on whether you decide to add warlords. They add an extra power. You can choose not to use the asymmetric player abilities, and, and that can simplify things a little bit. We always use the, the tribe abilities because we think that makes it extra fun. Uh, but with the random events that occur, with the asymmetric player powers, the games play out differently every time. It poses you a different puzzle every single time. In this game, you are managing resources and you never have enough to do all the things that you might like to do. You're planning ahead as well. And, and whenever we're talking about planning and budgeting and, and tackling things in an organized way, we're always talking about executive functioning skills. Those are the abilities that you need in order to reach a future goal. And they do include things like monitoring your progress, planning ahead, and being organized in your approach. And like I said, it is a game that poses a different puzzle for you every time. So there is a lot of logical problem solving, but the, the problems are always slightly different. And when we're talking about novel problem solving and logical problem solving, we are talking about fluid reasoning, that flexible problem solving that allows you to work with incomplete information or to tackle new kinds of problems. And it is a, a good kind of game to practice those skills. I had someone recently ask me the question of whether I could find some, some articles or resources about the psychological or cognitive abilities that we're talking about in these games. And I found a great article on Scientific American that's all about flexible problem solving and fluid reasoning and things that you can do to improve it. That is a really important skill in the IQ test that we use. And one of the ways that you can improve your fluid reasoning is to work on novel problems. So learning new board games or tackling new kinds of puzzles like this exercises your brain in a way that may be able to develop those fluid reasoning skills. So I'll include a link to that article in the show notes. I may even include a clickable link down here somewhere. We'll see if I can figure out how to do that. I'm still learning. So I'm learning novel skills and new skills all the time. Okay, let's talk about the Beasts and Bronze expansion for Rise of Tribes. This, like I said, just came out, well, it was delivered to me last week and, and I ordered it through the, the Kickstarter. Hopefully it'll show up before too long in retail. Uh, there are two different elements to this game. One is a new event deck with a pile of beasts. 
When it comes to the beast section of the beast and bronze expansion, you do wind up with a whole bunch of these extra beasts, these animal meeples. And uh, what I really, really like is that everything fits into the box and this box closes up tightly and it fits into the main game box. So everything fits all together in one box and you can still close it, which is unheard of, I think, with many of those board games. Here underneath you can see that there is a there's an altar and there's a wooden canoe and those are events from the base game. This volcano goes right on top of those. At least I, this was the best way that I could fit everything together. And then you can fit the Orok and the Cave Bear. They sort of go back to back in this little space. You can see there's a saber tooth tiger. There's some eagles. I've included the original uh, little wooden resources from the first game. But that's just the storage of the components. Uh, the, the events themselves, well, this, this is the cave bear, and he's one that gets set up right at the beginning of the game. So if you're going to use the cave bear, you do it when you set up the map. He, go, he can't go in an outside hex, so in a two-player game, he's going to wind up sort of right in the middle of the board. And then anyone who gathers from around the outside is going to have to put one of those resources onto the middle. And the only way to get rid of this bear is to build a village in the hex where the bear resides. This Mastodon is another setup uh, beast and he goes on an outside hex and when his event gets triggered, he's going to stampede in the longest straight line possible and he's, he's going to kill a tribes member in each of these hexes, but he's going to add a resource to each of those hexes. So the player who occupies is going to maybe be able to grab a resource from, from that accidental stampede. And there are there are wolves and there are eagles and there are <laughs> there's a rats event that I this one came up when we played anyone with a village is going to lose a food to the rats but if you don't have a village maybe your tribe will hunt the rats and you gain an extra food there's no meeples to go along with the rats it's just an event so the beasts are you know you get these cool meeples and and they they add some new events and more randomization maybe to the game. I don't think these are the most earth shattering uh, parts of this expansion because the bronze part of the expansion is about gaining bronze age technologies. There are three of these technologies, trade routes, metallurgy, and writing. The trade routes allows you at the start of your turn to place one of your resources on here and then that counts as a wild resource. You can spend it as anything you want, which might be really helpful, especially in a map like this where the three lakes are all crowded together. It was kind of a bad shuffle. So the three lakes are all together over here. So this person is not is going to have trouble earning food. So if he makes wood a wild resource, then he can spend wood as if it were food. Here again, uh, another start of the turn ability, and you can choose a, a new leader ability. Like this one from the Volketh Invasion, you can seize a village. So if you're in a battle where there's a village, normally that village would get destroyed when the tribe gets wiped out. But if you've got the seize ability, you take control of the village instead. The Volketh tribe can also pillage, which allows them to gain a resource for each of the tribes members, the opponent's tribes members that gets removed from the board in a conflict with their tribe. Metallurgy allows you to eliminate tribe members from a hex that you occupy for each village that you have. So it makes the villages even more powerful. So these are really interesting, I think, really interesting technologies. And even the way that you activate them is interesting. When I build a village, I can take one of these. You can be working with more than one at a time, but you only get to grab one for each village that you build. You put it so that this little color is facing up. And Trade Roots is a perfect one for this map because I'm stuck over here on this side. There's no lakes. So being able to have a wild resource might be really helpful. During that village building and goal completion phase, I can also spend some resources here to work towards inventing this Bronze Age technology. This means that once I spend these three wood, I get the first development in my deck. So that deck has been shuffled and I might flip it over and, well, we talked about the bow before and that was still on top. I would get this for free. I don't have to pay two wood and one stone, but I don't get the victory point when I play this. And then once I've spent the resources, I've got my new invention, my technology, I go to the next one. 
This one says I need to sacrifice three villagers, three tribes members from a hex with the village. Now I can't do this this turn because I only have three. And if I eliminate all of the tribes members from that hex, then the village goes away. It's destroyed. So I need to keep at least one person remaining. I might then next turn have to grow the tribe in order to accomplish this. And then I get another development. So this is going to give me two developments. For the third turn, I would have to control three edge hexes. That might be a little bit easier in a two-player game because almost all of the hexes are edge hexes. And then... Once that goal is accomplished, I rotate it through the last one, and now I have my Trade Roots card that I can use for the rest of the game. The Bronze Age technologies also give you a new victory condition, because if you invent all three of them, you win the game. You don't have to get those 15 victory points, so you need to keep an eye on the players and what they might be working on and make sure that they don't control enough edge hexes or that they can't get their hands on enough wood, for example, to be able to, to invent that technology. Maybe you want to destroy their villages so that they can't sacrifice those villagers. And that is the Bronze Age section of the Beasts and Bronze expansion. So you get that big box that has the, all these great big beast meeples in it and a brand new deck full of events. And then you get these technologies that give you lots of advantages and a new victory condition for the game. It's just changing the puzzle and increasing the novelty, right? Once you're used to playing the base game, maybe now you need to add something different in order to mix things up. Of course, I'm all about playing games with family and friends, but I did have someone on Facebook ask me about the solo rules for this game. So the Volketh Invasion expansion does provide you with some solo rules. You start by setting up the map as if you were playing a two-player game, but each of the hexes has now a little number token on it that goes from one to nine. There's nine spaces on the board. The six goes in the middle and you kind of work around that. Your opponent in the solo game is the Volketh Invaders, of course, and they have a big board like this. Each of these circles is going to be covered by one of these little warlord tokens at the start of the game, but you, take, you choose one of them to take off and put on their lowest numbered space that they occupy. So they're going to have one of these abilities open at the beginning of the game. You use one of their meeples, it can be any colored meeple, I've picked yellow here, to cover up these spaces as well. Now, if they grow enough that you run out of these little wooden guys to put on the board, then they have to start taking meeples off of here, and that means that the player is going to drop by one victory point for each one. You may be able to see here, and it says minus one VP on each of those spaces. So those will be covered until they run out of meeples to play on the board, which means you've got to really get into conflict with these guys. And I found when I played this game as a solo player that it was a tough balance for me, at least the first time playing, to work towards the goals I wanted to work on while stopping the opponent from reaching their goals. I was constantly having to jump into conflict that normally I probably wouldn't have if I were just playing the regular game. In addition to the player board and the numbered hexes, there's also a separate event deck for the solo game. So a lot of the events are very similar or the same as the ones in the base game or even from Beasts and Bronze, but they've got some variations to account for the fact that there's not multiple players who are playing the game. So it's a, a different set of event cards. Those pop up just exactly the same way they did in the other game. If I roll doubles, then an event is going to get activated. The other difference is that the opposing player, the invaders, don't roll dice. They use these three decks of cards. Hopefully you can see them. But there's three decks of cards with a different number of masks, one, two, or three masks. And those are put in separate piles. At the beginning of the game, you turn over a number one. You take the two action dice that you would have rolled as the player in the previous turn. You turn them to these faces, and then you put them into these action spaces. So in this case, the invader is going to move into the highest numbered hex, uh, and then they're, going to, they're also going to grow. That's a little bit tough right now because they only have one in each. I set it up at the easy level. You can put one, two, or three of these guys in, in the, the first three hexes at the beginning of the game. If I had instead chosen to make it a little bit more difficult, well, now I can move into the, the highest numbered hex that's adjacent, and now I'm controlling four spaces, 
instead of three. Down here, you might be able to see that the that there's a goal at the bottom of each of these cards, and the goal in this case is to control the center hex. And now they do have a meeple in the center hex. If they're able to achieve that goal, that's going to give them three resources. Once you've done the two actions, just like as if it were the player's turn, you resolve any conflict. So if I would have had a bunch of guys in here, then it would have created a conflict and, and you'd have to resolve that before you move on to the next phase, which is a little bit different. The invaders do not build villages. Instead, they summon warlords. And those are those little tokens that were covering up sections of this invader board. Each time I remove one and put it on a hex that I occupy, it's going to give the invaders an additional power. This power gets activated whenever a card is drawn that, that allows the invader to take a lead action. They don't draw goals or development cards. Instead, the lead actions activate these abilities. How do the invaders summon those warlords? Well, all they have to do is have six resources. So anytime they gather, some of those, those cards will allow them to take a gather action. They're going to get some resources based on whether how many suns or moons or blank uh, dice there are on that section of the board. Uh, and it doesn't matter which ones they take. It's sort of they're all wild for the invaders. Once you get six, then in that final phase, that fifth phase of the round, they're going to summon one of those warlords and gain an additional power. So next time they get a lead action, there's more things that are going to be activated. Now, because the invaders don't have villages, then they don't do the score villages phase at, at the beginning of the turn. Instead, you check their goal. There's a goal at the bottom of each of these little cards. And in this case, like I said, it was to control the center hex. And if they still control the center hex at the beginning of the next invader turn, then they've achieved their goal. The reward that they get in this case is three resources. The next turn, what's going to happen is you'll discard this card, and if they achieve their goal, they get those resources, but whether or not they achieved it, you're going to draw a card that has three masks on it. And now you get to do some different actions, move and then a lead action. Well, that means that you're going to activate those Warlord powers. This is a real challenging card to come up on the second turn of the game because the goal is for me to have no villages on the board and it's pretty hard to build villages so early on so they're probably going to reach that goal and get two more resources and, and so now even though they haven't gathered anything if they achieve the last goal they get three this one they get two so they're getting pretty close to summoning another warlord and then they, they're going to gain more and more power as they go through the game. Here are the different abilities that the invaders might have. They can steal resources from the player. They can convert a tribe member. So in this hex where I've got one invader and two of my meeples, that lead action would allow them to switch that around, which is a pretty powerful ability. Uh, if, there, if there are hexes adjacent that have no invaders, you can add invaders to the board. That's another ability. You can, oh, look at this one. This, this was one that was brutal when I was playing. You can return all in progress goals to the discard pile. So now all of a sudden, the developments that you're working on are going to get uh, trashed and your bronze technologies, your bronze age technologies are gonna get reversed a step. So you turn those, those little cards counterclockwise instead of clockwise. The final warlord ability is to trigger a conflict in shared hexes. In this case in the center, this is the only shared hex. I haven't moved anybody over into the middle here or into the other side. So even though there are fewer than five tribes members in this hex, conflict is going to be triggered and I'm going to lose one of my tribes members. Another tricky thing about these warlords is that you can't put two warlords in the same hex and the, I can't build a village in any hex that has one of those warlord tiles. So that definitely complicates things as the invaders start to spread across the board. Just like in the base game, the player wins if he manages to get those 15 victory points, but the invader wins if the final warlord gets summoned from that board. So you really have to stop them from getting those six resources at a time that allow them to grow and grow in power. And that is Rise of Tribes, Beasts and Bronze, and the Volketh Invasion 
in a rather large nutshell. This is a puzzly strategy game with, a, with complexity that can be adjusted depending on the experience and age of the players. It evokes all the feelings of more complex strategy games, but you can play it in under an hour. It doesn't take long to set up. All of the pieces fit together nicely in the box, which does not always happen like I said, and you get to exercise those executive functioning and fluid reasoning skills. Like I said, I'm gonna put uh, a link to a nice resource that I found about fluid reasoning. Uh, I will also find one of my, I'll find a link to one of my favorite resources for executive functioning as well. If you have any suggestions or comments, you can leave them in the comment section of the video below, or you can email me at brian at brainsongames.ca. BrainsOnGames.ca is the website. That's where future episodes will go when the previous episodes are up there already. BrainsOnGames is the Twitter handle and the Instagram feed and the Facebook page. So we're all over the place. We're even on Clubhouse, although it says under Brian McDonald on Clubhouse. And if you enjoyed this video and you'd like to be notified of future ones, you can always head on over to YouTube and click that subscribe button. Thanks for joining me. Hopefully I'll see you next time. Bye.